Another interesting phenomenon is called beats. This is otherwise known as interference over time, not over space. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, suppose uh, I look at two oscillations happening at the same moment. Okay, this time I don't use the regular resonance condition. Uh, I'm sorry, re regular coherence condition, which means the two uh, the two waves must have exactly the same frequency and so forth. Rather, I consider there is a slight variation in their frequency. So the first wave has an angular frequency omega 1. The second one has an angular frequency omega 2. Now, I want omega 1 and omega 2 to be slightly different from each other. However, I don't want them to be very different. Okay, so there is a slight difference only. And for simplicity, let's say they have the same amplitude. Okay, so let's, for example, you can play two tuning forks. Okay, say they differ by, say, 1 or 2 hertz. Okay, so here is the sound produced by tuning fork 1, here's the sound produced by tuning fork 2. Now, what if you bang these two tuning forks simultaneously? What are you going to hear? Okay, what you hear is something interesting, it's called beats. Let's look at what happens. Uh, you need to add these two cosine functions together, and here is the formula from your high school math. Okay, cosine alpha plus cosine beta, here's the formula. Alpha is omega 1t, beta is omega 2t. So let's plug this formula in and let's see what happens. So when I, when I have both of these two sources playing simultaneously, I get y equals to, all right, 2a and then cosine, all right, uh, alpha minus beta, so omega 1t minus omega 2t divided by 2, right? Omega 1 minus omega 2, we call it delta omega, okay, times t over 2, right? And then uh, there is a cosine function again. This time it's alpha plus beta over 2. So omega 1 t plus omega 2 t over 2. Okay, now omega 1 plus omega 2 divided by 2. Isn't that the average value of omega? Okay, average omega times t. All right, here's the trick. The trick here is that delta omega is very, very small compared with the average value of omega. Let's say, uh, you know, let's say we have two tuning forks, one at 440 hertz, the other one at 441 hertz. Okay. So omega is 2 pi times 440 something. It's much, much greater than delta omega, which is only 2 pi times 1 hertz, right? So what we have here is uh, the product of two cosine functions. They both vary with time, but they vary at very different rate. This one varies with a angular frequency of delta omega over 2, which is much, much slower than omega bar, okay? So this omega bar varies very quickly, and that one varies a lot slower. So what we can effectively do is to think of this whole thing as a time varying amplitude, a t. Okay, so this basically is an oscillation of cosine function, okay, cosine function with the average frequency, average angular frequency, um, but it, its amplitude changes over time, or it is, we say it is modulated over time with a slow, time varying, varying function, 2a cosine delta omega t over 2. Now, if we plot a as a, a t as a function of time, you find a slow varying function of time. Okay, here is the t-axis. This is the slow varying function. So, 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 so you know, it's, 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 it's like this, okay? Slow varying function. Um, but, of course, something's going on where when uh, you know the amplitude changes right and that is there is a cosine function so the actual oscillation okay this is this is why okay the actual oscillation uh, would be the product of the of the amplitude and this cosine function this cosine function varies a lot faster so you have something like this okay Something like this. All right. Uh, now, we can look at a wave pattern like this. Remember, this is the t-axis, not the x-axis. Okay, so when you listen to these two sources playing at the same time, you find 
two things. First of all, you are going to hear pretty much the frequency of either one of them because here is an average frequency. Remember, they, these two frequencies are very close to each other, so you know they only differ about say one or two hertz. So essentially, you are listening to uh, you know something like 440 hertz. Okay, I mean whether it's 440 or 441, uh, most people cannot tell the difference really. But the interesting part is that the amplitude of this 440 hertz signal is not a constant rather it changes over time like here weak and then strong and weak and then strong and weak and strong there is a modulation in the amplitude or in the intensity okay now let's see how long it takes to go from here to there that in fact is a whole variation okay is a whole variation of this uh, cosine function. So in other words, the phase angle of this cosine function, of this cosine function between here and there is two pi. Okay, uh, that would be the uh, you know the period of this uh, particular cosine function. So what is the period of this particular cosine function? Uh, you know the uh, frequency of this term is delta angular frequency of this term is delta omega over two, right? So the uh, what is how long does it take to go from here to there uh, that you will have to take 2 pi divided by the angular frequency right so the time it, it takes to go from here to there that would be 2 pi divided by this angular frequency okay which is delta omega over 2 by the way uh, at this point let me introduce the frequency itself instead of the angular frequency so so uh, omega equals 2 pi f Okay, so in other words, delta omega really is just 2 pi delta f. So what's delta f? is the frequency difference between these two signals, not the angular frequency difference. Okay, you divide by 2. What do you get? You cross out the 2 pi, right? You cross out the 2 pi. What do you get? You get uh, 2 over delta f. That is the time it takes to go from here to there. But you know, going from here to there, our ears have experienced two cycles of variation in intensity, right? Here we have we hear nothing, and then strong, and then weak, and then strong, and then weak, right? Now, if we are looking for the time it takes for the intensity that we hear to change once, okay, to repeat one cycle, then we're looking for the time to go from here to there, right? And that is half of that time, okay? So. The time it takes to go from here to there for the intensity to vary one cycle t b b standing for beats t of b really is just half of this time so t of b equals to one over delta f now i can reverse i can invert t of b to get the frequency of the beat so what did that tell us it tells us the frequency of the beats equals to delta F, which is F1 minus F2. Okay. This is a so-called beat frequency. In other words, if you have two tuning forks, one at 440 hertz, another one at 441 hertz, you play them simultaneously. You can pretty much hear something around 440, except that the intensity, okay, the strength of the signal varies at a rate of one hertz. That is called the beat frequency, uh, because 441 minus 440, that's one hertz. So the intensity would go up, down, up, down, up, down, and the cycle at the rate of one cycle per second. Of course, one cycle per second, our ears are good enough to, to discern that. If it's uh, two cycles per second, we can still count, right? We, we, we can hear the signal going up and down, up and down, uh, twice, a, twice a time, uh, twice a second, and even three or four we can do. But if the, uh, you know, if the cycle, uh, if, if delta F is, say, 20 hertz, that would mean that, uh, you know, the intensity goes up and down, up and down, up and down, 20 times a second. That's kind of hard for our ears to, uh, to discern, so we're going to lose track. How many times goes up and down? Okay, so uh, to hear beat distinctively, what you need, you need two frequencies, but you want two frequencies to be very close to each other, you know, no more than a few hertz away from each other. This is called beats. Uh, can you think of an application of this phenomenon, beat? What do we need that for? Um, okay, how about this? Suppose you make a living as a piano tuner. Okay, what you need to do is to make sure 
that you adjust the tension of each uh, string. Remember, that's how we tune the piano, right? We adjust the tension so that the you know the string produces the exact right frequency. Let's say 440 hertz. Okay. Now, when you when a piano is being played for uh, over some time, it's going to go out of tune. Uh, sometimes the frequency gets a little too high. Sometimes it's a little too low. That's why the tuner comes in to try to adjust the tension to make it go back to 440 hertz. Now, how would the tuner accomplish that? Uh, if you strike that key, let's say the correct value should be 440 hertz, okay? But in reality, it's actually 442 hertz. Uh, many people cannot really tell that much of a difference uh, if it's one or two hertz. If you have really sharp ears, you can tell, oh, this is a little bit higher in frequency than I wanted. So it's, we say it's out of tune, so the piano tuner comes in. But no matter how good the tuner is, the tuner cannot tell exactly how many hertz higher is this thing out of tune? Okay, he cannot tell whether it's 441 hertz, 442 hertz, or 443 hertz, and so on. Okay, nobody has ears that good, that quantitative, you know? So what do you do? Okay, what you can do if you're a piano tuner is if you bring in a tuning fork, which is exactly at 440 hertz. And what you do then is you strike that piano key, right? That is one frequency, that's one source and you bang your tuning fork that's the second source, at the same moment all right so if these two frequencies are different when produced by the string when not produced by the tuning fork which is standard what are you going to have well you're going to hear a beat right now the beat frequency you can easily count like one two three four so on let's say there are two ups and downs per second what is that telling you it tells you there is a two hertz difference okay between the standard tuning fork at 440 and the, um, uh, the the string, which is out of tune. In other words, the string is either vibrating at 438, which is 2 hertz below 440, or at 442, which is 2 hertz above it. Now, how do you tell whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, uh, higher or lower? Well, there are many things you can do. For example, you can uh, slightly increase the tension of the string which slightly increases the uh, frequency produced by the string right produced by the first source right and then you 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 look at the beats again okay listen to beats again if the beat frequency gets lower what does that tell you it tells you delta f is smaller which means uh you know bringing the uh uh the string frequency higher reduces the difference between the string frequency and the actual frequency which is at 440 hertz, which means the string frequency was lower to begin with. Okay, so you increased a little bit, the situation improved. So what does that tell you? It was at 438 hertz to begin with, so you have to increase the tension, okay, to bring it up. And if you increase the tension and you play the beats again, you find the beat frequency increases, okay, it becomes three cycles per second instead of two. That means you're going in the wrong direction, okay? It was already 442 to begin with, you just made it made it even worse. All right, so this is a, a simple application of the beat phenomenon. Here's one more diagram concerning beats. We said that uh, the beat phenomenon is interference of two sources in time, not in space. Uh, let's take a look and you'll see what I mean. I have here two sources, one depicted in black, another one depicted in blue. Okay, uh, look at this moment. You see at this moment, the first wave and second wave, they're pretty much out of phase. See that? They're pretty much out of phase. Uh, so that the resultant frequency, uh, the resultant amplitude is pretty low. Okay, it's, it's pretty low. Now remember, they don't have the same frequency. So if they're out of phase, then they're not going to be out of phase all the time. Okay, they gradually become, they go through. Uh, different phase angles over time you know if they make the frequencies exactly the same then once they're out of phase you have no luck they will always be out of phase but that is not the case so as time progresses you know at this point they're still out of phase in fact at this point they're exactly out of phase so the resultant oscillation is zero in amplitude and then uh, the blue curve has slightly higher frequency than the black one okay so you know the the, the, the frequency difference I mean the uh, the, the the phase difference will change over time and you gradually move forward, forward, forward. You see at this point, you know, the two waves are pretty much in phase already. All right. So you see uh, the amplitude increases, right? And look at that point. 
How about that? At that point, both waves are up at maximum. They have to be in phase at this particular moment. Okay, so you see, the amplitude of the resonant wave is largest. And then, as time progresses, they, once again, they start to go out of phase, out of phase, out of phase, more and more, until at that point, they become exactly out of phase. One is up, the other down, they cancel each other out. Okay, so you have a uh, minimum in sound intensity. So this is why you have this variation in intensity. It's because the frequency is being slightly different. These two waves can go from out of phase to in phase to out of phase to in phase to out of phase as time progresses. And if that happens slowly enough, let's say once or twice per second, uh, we can easily discern it. So that's where the uh, that's where the uh, phenomenon beat comes from.